Well, good morning again. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and several other portions of Scripture that, that go along with this and complement this. We have been studying the ministry of the Holy Spirit over the course of the past group of weeks, and today we're going to be talking about, you're going to notice a, a word that gets repeated. It's the word sanctification. It comes up multiple times in Scripture. It's a ministry of the Holy Spirit. But we're, in general, talking about the fact that through the work of the Spirit, we are not who we once were. You and I are not who we once were. We're not the same people we were when He found us. And so we're going to start this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to pick up at verse 9 and read down to verse 11, and then we'll reread that in uh, just a little bit. But this is what it says, starting with the, that portion of Scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, starting with verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the Spirit of our God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to be able to look at this portion of Scripture together today. And we pray, Lord, that as we, as we do so, that you'd help us to see with your eyes, that we would understand who we are in you, and that we would ultimately grow in our walk with you because of the work that you're doing in our lives through your Spirit. Father, we're just so grateful for the fact that you have given us your word, you give us instruction, you give us the internal counsel of your Holy Spirit who is present within us. And so, Lord, we pray that as we study your word this morning, we pray that you would give us your insight, that you'd help us to understand it, and that you'd continue to develop our faith and help us grow. We love you, Lord, and we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name, amen. So one of my favorite theological questions to ask doesn't really sound like a theological question at all, but I do like to ask it because I think it reveals a lot of things about a person's mindset or a person's worldview or a person's belief. And the question I like to ask is very simple. It's, it's this, who are you? So we've probably all wrestled with that question in one respect or another, but it's an, in, it's, it's an interesting question to ask ourselves, interesting question to ask others, who are you? Now, the interesting thing about asking that question is that there's an irony to the answers that many people give when they're asked that question, because many people don't ask, they don't answer that question at all when that question gets posed. Many people typically answer a very different question. You ask them, who are you? And they typically respond with an answer that's more fitting for the question, what do you do? And those are two very different questions, who we are and what we do. Now, frequently people give answers like this. So you'll, you'll say, all right, who are you? And they're going to give you answers that are more along the lines of what they do, but they'll say something like, oh, I'm a baseball player, or I'm an accountant. And you look at those answers and you realize neither of those responses adequately answer the question, who are you? Because those answers involve circumstances that can change. And if you're answering the question, who are you, and you're utilizing circumstances that can change to answer that question, you're answering a different question. You may play baseball today, but you're not going to play baseball forever. You may track figures and do taxes today, but you won't do that forever. In eternity, you're not going to be tracking figures and doing taxes, I promise. Our real identity is something that will remain true of us today tomorrow, and for all eternity. So when we answer that question, who are you, it has to be something that remains eternally true. So for those of us who have faith in Jesus Christ, a more accurate response to the question, who are you, should be something like this. I'm justified. Or I'm a new creation in Christ. Because that's going to be true of us forever, not just for a season. We could also say something like this. I'm set apart as holy in God's sight, because that's never going to change either, according to the Word of God. Now, there's a process that we're going through right now, and it's useful for us to know this process. 
I think it's, it's worth understanding if, if we want to excel at understanding the deeper nature of the faith that we profess. It's interesting to know and useful to know what God is doing in our lives, what God is accomplishing in us right here and right now. And it's a process that looks a lot like this. At the moment we came to faith in Jesus Christ, we were justified, which means we were declared righteous before God. Declared righteous before God, justified in that moment. Scripture also reveals to us that in the future, in heaven, we're going to be glorified, which means we're also going to be given brand new bodies that no longer struggle with sin and no longer show the effects of sin. That sounds very appealing. So the moment you came to faith in Christ, you were justified. In heaven, we're going to be glorified. But right now, we live in between those two time periods. So what's the Lord doing in your life and in my life right now? If we know Jesus Christ, what's he doing in us at present? What does the work of God look like? Well, the scripture reveals to us that the Holy Spirit is actively and progressively sanctifying us. And what that means when that term gets used, so we just use three theological terms, justification, that's when we were declared righteous in the eyes of God through the work of Christ. Glorification, that's when we get a new body and we'll be sinless in eternity. Sanctification, that's the process we're going through right now where the Holy Spirit is separating us from the things of this world and He is producing holiness in our lives. He's helping our faith mature, and He's creating within us a desire to obey the Word of God. That's what's happening in your life right now if you've yielded your heart over to Jesus Christ. We are not who we once were. The old is gone, Scripture says, the new has come, and going forward, we should never attempt to try and achieve our sense of identity or anchor our sense of identity, we could even say, in something that could change or in a behavior that we used to indulge in. That's not our identity. And that appears to be a concept that the young Christians in the city of Corinth that the Apostle Paul was trying to talk to as he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians seems to be a concept that they were really struggling with. It seems like many of those young believers in that context were trying to anchor their sense of identity to a variety of things that they once indulged in, and maybe some of them were still attempting to kind of walk the line saying, maybe it's okay that I still indulge in some of these things. When you look at what he says, I'm going to, we just read this, but I'm going to reread it for us. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9-11, Paul says it this way. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So Paul's trying to make something very, very clear here to the church at Corinth. He's trying to help them understand you aren't who you once were. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we become part of the kingdom of God. And as Paul was speaking to the Corinthians and as he was trying to minister to them, it was his expectation that the Corinthians would live lives that were consistent with the reality, that, they are, that, they're, that they're part of the, fa the family of God, the kingdom of God. And at the time of his writing here, as he's writing to the church, the dominant characteristics in their lives seem to resemble the standards and the values of this sinful world more so than the kingdom of God. And so you have Paul saying, I could say this many different ways. Do you ever find yourself in a spot where you have to tell somebody the truth, but you're like, how do I want to... How do I want to say this? And as the Spirit of God inspired Paul's pen to write this down, his hand to write this down with his pen, he decided not to mince words. He decided to just shoot straight with the church. So he didn't mince words, and he assured them. He said, look, here's, here's the deal. Here's how it goes. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's plain and simple. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what he's saying to this church was, if you persist in unrighteousness, what you're doing is you're demonstrating that your faith in Christ that you have been professing isn't actually sincere. You're kidding yourself. You're being a fake. You don't actually believe what you're saying you believe. If you believe it, you could tell what a person really believes at their core by what comes out in their life. That's in every sphere of life. 
You can tell what I believe by what comes out in my life. I can tell what you believe by what comes out in your life. And Paul was saying to the Corinthians, I'll tell you, about, I'll tell you what you really believe by what comes out of your life. And so he was challenging them, basically saying, look, uh, unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. And if that's the fruit of your life, you're demonstrating you don't actually believe what you're professing to believe. And so Paul here cautions the church, and he tells them not to be deceived. And he told them that those who live lives of, and he, he's very specific here, of sexual immorality or homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he also says, nor will thieves, nor will drunkards, nor will liars. And in saying this, he's trying to communicate that those who live a life like this without remorse, not caring for what matters to God, they're showing themselves to be people who never believed in the first place. Now, here's the thing, and I hope this sticks in our hearts and our minds, and this is something that we find helpful. As believers in Christ, yes or no, do we struggle with sin? Yes, right? We do struggle with sin. If you're a professing believer in Christ, I'm certain that you still struggle with sin. I'm a professing believer in Christ. I still struggle with sin. Every professing believer in Christ I've ever met still struggles with sin. So sure, believers still struggle with sin, but there's a very big difference between struggling with sin and embracing it and then taking that embrace and carving your whole sense of identity around it. This world wants you and I to embrace the very things that Jesus set us free from. This world wants you and I to embrace the chains that Christ liberated us from. This world wants you and I to indulge in things that are unwise, unhealthy, and ungodly, and then carve our entire sense of identity around those things, and then the world will applaud you. It will celebrate you if you do it. You will feel like you fit in in so many places if you just acquiesce to that lie and that deception. And then you look at what Scripture says, and it says, no, don't be deceived. Most of the people around you are being deceived. Don't jump in with that. Don't be deceived. And Paul here, he lists a whole bunch of activities that, that these believers were once engaged in, and he reminds the church that this is what they once were. He says, that's what you were, right? He says, and such were some of you, and such were some of you. But you're no longer viewed that way in God's eyes because through faith in Jesus Christ, you've been made new. And Paul goes on to tell them that they were what? He says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, this isn't the only place in Scripture where that new identity is spoken of or where that work of the Spirit is referenced. When you look in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 20, verse 22, it tells us this. It says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. It's talking about this idea of this new life that we've been blessed with in Christ, as we've been cleansed of our sin. And so that means that in Christ, the adulterer is no longer an adulterer. He's made new and he's holy and blameless in God's sight. That means the person who once practiced homosexuality no longer wears that label because they're made new in Christ. And the same is true for the person that struggled with an alcohol addiction. They're no longer a drunkard. They're made new in Christ. Or the person who used to steal all the time. When I was growing up, I had someone in my life who literally would steal from me and my family all the time would happen all the time. And I remember growing up thinking like, why, like, why is this person doing this? It was a distant relative who would steal from us all the time. It used to drive me nuts. And I remember at one point just being like, like, I don't even know how to stop this. And then you look at this portion of scripture that says, the thief is no longer the thief in the eyes of God, that the Lord can change the mind and the heart of the thief or the swindler or whomever it may be. And if Christ has freed us from our old lives, and if he's freed us from those false identities, why return to them? If you believe in Jesus Christ, you don't need, if any of those things on, on Paul's list in 1 Corinthians 6 once characterized you, and if you even at one point either purposely wrapped your sense of identity around those things, or if other people labeled you as one of those things, you no longer need to adopt that as your mindset or your identity. 
Because that's not how God sees you. And if God doesn't see you that way, there's no reason for you to continue seeing your, yourself that way. So what does that mean, though, for our church in the midst of a culture like we live in? And, and maybe we could ask this, too. If someone's struggling in one of these areas currently at present, if it's not past tense, if it's present, someone's struggling in one of these areas, what should our response as a church family be? How do you think we're supposed to respond to some of these things? Well, I think we're supposed to be honest. You know, when you look at the Apostle Paul, he's pretty honest about addressing what's healthy and what's unhealthy. So I think honesty matters. And in response to one another, I think we're to show love. I think we're to show mercy. I think we're to show grace and kindness. And to invite anyone who would listen to embrace Christ and let go of the chains of their sin. Because some will listen. Some won't, but some will. And that invitation needs to always be there. A while back, this actually happened some time ago, I received an email during the course of the week from someone in our church family, and I'll, I'll keep this all very anonymous. But they were asking me if I, if I would personally be okay with them inviting their friend who actively practices homosexuality to one of our worship services. And I replied, definitely. Yes. I, I would love if they came. And so they came. And I was very glad that they came. I hope that they come again. Now, obviously, the message that we preach is very different from what this culture is teaching on that subject. So I actually, in my mind, I thought, wow, it's rather brave that that person chose to come because you would, they knew where we line up on cultural issues and sexual issues and relational issues. And I thought, wow, it was rather brave that they chose to come. And my sincere hope for this person is that they'd come to faith in Jesus, experience brand new life in Him, experience, experience everlasting joy in Him, and a new identity in Him. That they would understand how He wants to see them and what He's offering them. And here's the thing, a major part of the confusion in our culture today, again, it, it stems from people trying to build a sense of identity based on an activity. We try to build our identity off of what we do. Some of us have done it. I, I've met other pastors who do this. They build their whole sense of identity over the fact that they're a pastor. Guess what? In eternity, you're not going to be a pastor. Your services will be rendered unnecessary. <laughs> the great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus Christ, will, will handle it, right? So if your sense of identity is that you're a pastor, or that you're a missionary, or that you're an accountant, or that you're an athlete, or that you're a musician, or whatever, if, the, if that's what your sense of identity is wrapped around, you're wrapping your identity around an activity and not who you are in eternity. But we do that, right? We try and build our identity off of what we do instead of who we are. All of us have probably made that mistake to one degree or another. I certainly have. But in Christ, we are not who we once were. Our identity is no longer anchored in what we do, but who we are in Him. And He invites us to be people that are convinced that in His sight, we're adopted into His family. That's forever true, isn't it? That we're forgiven of our sin. That's forever true. That we're recipients of His grace and mercy. Well, that's forever true. That we're blessed with the undeserved gift of His righteousness. Again, that's forever true. If you list any of those things as where your identity or your sense of identity is found, you would be right. You would be accurate because those will be forever true of you, forgiven, recipients of mercy, blessed with the undeserved gift of righteousness. But the process that the Holy Spirit is bringing us through, this process of sanctification, it takes time. There's time involved in this process. It's a blessing from God. Again, it's highlighted in multiple places in Scripture. And in fact, the Apostle Paul also brought it up when he wrote to the church at Thessalonica. He said this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. He says, but we ought always... Catch some of the things he says here, because he makes a few identity statements here too. He says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So in writing to these believers, as Paul's writing to them, he expresses gratefulness to them, so we can see that, right? He was thankful for what the Lord had done in their lives, and he describes them in a variety of ways here. He describes them as people who are genuinely loved by the Lord. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? 
genuinely loved by the Lord. He also calls them chosen, saved, sanctified, and then describes them as being people who are filled with a sincere faith. Now, I'll tell you what, that's a great way for Christians of all eras to begin seeing themselves because these statements of identity are not bound by time. It can be true of you now and true of you 10,000 years from now. These descriptions of believers will remain true for all eternity. Let me ask this in a personal way. Does it do your heart good to know that you're loved by the Lord, that you're deeply loved by the Lord? Does that do your heart good? That does my heart good. Do you rejoice in the fact that he chose you to be part of his family long before that was ever on your radar? So what Scripture reveals, how that works, it seems a bit mysterious, but that's what Scripture tells us. And you have Paul telling, you know, he says, all right, you're beloved, God chose you. Well, what else does he do as he describes these things in this passage? How about this? Are you relieved to be saved from your sin and saved from condemnation, whereas once you were under the wrath of God and doomed for an eternity of separation from him? So do your heart good to recognize that you have been saved from your sin and condemnation? Sometimes I get chills when I think about that, when I think about what I actually deserved and the permanent implications of what I deserved and the fact that through Jesus Christ, those, those, uh, that condemnation has been taken from upon me, that I, don't, that I don't have to enter into eternity with that weight. It's a beautiful thing. Isn't it a joy to know that you've been set apart in God's sight, as holy in His sight, that you're progressively growing in sanctification? as the Holy Spirit transforms you from within. We're a work in progress, right? And I hope that for each of us, a year from now, our faith is stronger than it is right now. Two years from now, stronger than it will be next year. Ten years from now, even stronger. That our trust in the Lord would deepen, that our desire to be obedient to the teaching of His Word would grow, that our demonstration of grace and mercy to others would continue to, to be fostered and mature, as the Holy Spirit produces sanctification in us. Do you ever meet somebody that's known the Lord for a long time, a senior saint that you talk to, and, and they just seem so sweet, and they seem so wonderful, and you can't imagine that they've been any other way at any other time of their life, and then they tell you their life story, and you're like, how is that even you? And then you realize, oh, I see what's happened. Progressively, over the course of your life, from the moment you met Jesus to this moment where now I get to meet you, the Holy Spirit has been accomplishing this work of sanctification, producing holiness in your life, and I'm seeing you at a more mature season, but you didn't start there. That's what you're saying? Nope, I didn't start here, but this is where the Lord has me today. Isn't it an exciting thing to know that that's a privilege that we get to walk through with the aid of the Holy Spirit as His power accomplishes that growth within us? If you ask the Lord to help you grow in your faith, do you think He's going to say no? Do you think he's going to say, I'm so sorry, there's like seven and a half other billion people on this earth. Your needs are inconsequential to me. You've now prayed according to my will, but I have chosen to say no to you. Would you think he'd have, he would do that? Of course not. He desires this. This is the work of the Spirit of God where he wants us to grow mature in our faith and glorify his name in the process. But here's the thing. Sometimes it's a bit of a bumpy road. And if you've traced the hand of God over the course of your life, you've probably noticed that there are seasons of your life where you felt like, yeah, that was a good moment. That was a spiritually strong moment. But do you ever go through a season where you kind of retrace a little bit, where you regress? And you're like, hey, what's going on? Earlier this week, I happened to watch two YouTube confessions. Now, there are a few channels I follow on YouTube. I'm probably not alone on that. Uh, you know, if you're somebody that likes to access video content off their platform, there's probably certain personalities or, or uh, shows or things like that that you find helpful and useful. And so earlier this week, uh, I happened to watch two video confessions. And uh, they were both posted by people that I've been following on YouTube for years. And the first video confession was posted by a man with an audience in the hundreds of thousands. And with tears in his eyes, whimpering like I often see children do who can't catch their breath when they're crying. So can you picture that when a child's crying and trying to use words and they're, they're like sniffing and, and almost seem like they're hyperventilating? Well, he, he did this. Um, he confessed in this video to cheating on his wife. 
And admittedly, as he confessed this, I was like, where is this coming from? I, I, was, I was surprised initially. I didn't see it coming. It wasn't something that I expected. And I was like, wow. And, um, you know, I, I, felt, I felt sad for the family, sad for him. Certainly a hard thing to hear. Then just yesterday, I was watching another video from a young woman in her, I think she's in her upper 20s, uh, who has a very popular YouTube presence. She's actually somebody that I interviewed for one of my podcasts a little less than two years ago, and someone I, I consider myself uh, at least loosely friends with their family, and she confessed on that video that she's pregnant. Said I'm pregnant. She's unmarried. She recently broke up with the man she was dating, and as she made her confession, she said this. She said, I would be grateful if the comments on this video weren't negative, but truthfully, there isn't a single negative thing you could say to me that I haven't already said to myself in recent days. She said, I think I've said them all. And she said, I just I felt the need that I, I needed to share this publicly because I have this public forum, and I wanted to share this and just be open about it. Both of these people profess, both the man who made his confession and this woman who made her confession, both of them profess to be believers in Jesus Christ, and I believe that they are. I believe that they are believers in Christ. But both of them, in a lapse of judgment, made decisions that obviously were not in line with God's will for them. And instead of cooperating with the sanctifying process of the Holy Spirit, the process that the Spirit of God's trying to bring them through, they worked against him for a period of time. Now, praise God for the mercy that we're shown in Jesus Christ, because in our own way, we've all done the same thing, haven't we? I mean, is there anyone that's made it through life thus far not working against the hand of God at times? I cannot come before you and say I have never tried to go in my own direction in all kinds of areas. And maybe you've done the same thing in, in your heart, your mind, your life, your actions, your words, the way you treated other people. We've all done that. Scripture tells us that these things are common to us all. So we can't look at somebody else and say, boy, they, they really goofed it up, and then think that somehow we're not prone to do the same things that anybody else might be prone to do. And I look at this situation, I think, you know what, just, let's just pause for a moment and thank God for the mercy that he shows us through his son, Jesus Christ. Because again, we've all drifted. We've all gone our own ways at different seasons of life. We've all veered off the path. And by the way, let me just encourage you, if presently right now, just being straight up honest, if you're presently veering off the path, let me just invite you to get back on the path. Let me just invite you to get back on. Don't spend your life veering. Spend your life walking in step with the Spirit. Sanctification is a process that takes time. It's a lifelong transformation. To be honest, as I listen to each of these confessions, one of the things that occurred to me as I was listening to it was that I was actually seeing the fruit of sanctification in those confessions. Would you agree with that? The fruit of sanctification was on display. I see the fruit of sanctification. Why would that man or why would that woman have been bothered to make public confessions in front of tens or hundreds of thousands of people? The one, that one channel is really, really popular and gets many, many views. Why would they, why would they be prompted to, to make such a confession that they could have at least tried to hide, but instead of trying to hide it, they made it public. Why would they do that if they weren't experiencing the fruit of repentance? This is the fruit of repentance in their life. This is them saying, you know what, I'm not going to lie anymore. I'm not going to run anymore. I'm not going to hide anymore. I'm just going to shoot straight. And I'm just going to tell people, even though it's going to cost me something, I'm just going to shoot straight and be honest. They know they got off track, but they also know that the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to pay for any sin. The mercy of Jesus is likewise available for anyone who comes to him in sincerity. You come to Christ with a sincere heart. You come before the Lord repentant. Will he not cleanse you of that sin? Will he not restore you? What does Scripture tell us over and over and over again? It encourages us that it's always safer to come before the Lord than to try and run from him. And I love in both of those confessions, even though I, you know, Sometimes that can be hard stuff to hear, but in both of their lives, the Holy Spirit is drawing them back to living by His power, and living by His wisdom, and to stop trying to live by their own. He's inviting them 
to embrace obedience to Jesus Christ instead of, instead of embracing rebellion. And both that man and that woman, what have they said? They've said yes to that invitation. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Peter even spoke of the connection between sanctification and obedience. When you look at the book of 1 Peter, we've been studying this on Wednesday nights at Bible study, and right in the opening section, he makes this connection between the sanctification process the Spirit of God is bringing us through and obedience to the Lord. It says, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. He equates the growth that comes through that sanctification process as the Holy Spirit is producing holiness in our lives. One of the most obvious fruits of sanctification is obedience to Jesus Christ, to the Word of God. Let me say this as we finish up. We're all at different spots in our walk with Christ. Every one of us, we're all at different spots in our walk with Him. We're all at different seasons of sanctification, you could say. We're all at different seasons of spiritual maturity. Maybe you're brand new to walking with Christ. Or maybe you've tried to walk away from Him for a time. Or maybe you're at a season of life where you've realized that there's no greater joy than walking with Him. Maybe you're at one of those three. Whatever season you're at, remember that you aren't who you used to be. Just like Paul said to the Corinthians, he said, these are things you once were, but it's not forever true of you. Those are labels you don't have to keep wearing and certainly things that you don't have to adopt as an identity. You aren't who you used to be. Keep in step with the Spirit of God as He seeks to produce holiness in your life. And you'll observe him doing some things that you'll, you'll say, this is miraculous. This is fruit that only God could produce from a human life. And it's a beautiful and it's a wonderful thing. And right now, I mean, obviously I'm looking forward to the days when we will be glorified in the presence of the Lord and we will struggle with sin no more. But in the meantime, isn't it nice to know that the Lord hasn't left us in this world to handle it all in our own strength and power by ourselves? We have the Spirit of God living within us, the Holy Spirit living within us, producing sanctification, helping us grow, mature in our walk with Jesus Christ in His power as it's applied to our day-to-day -day lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to be able to look at a portion of Scripture like this that is so different, obviously, Lord, from what many people in this world choose to embrace. We know, Lord, that that we live in the midst of a time where people are seeking an identity. People want to be associated with something, a movement, a cause, a behavior, an activity, a lifestyle, something. And when there's a void, when there's an absence for your presence in their day-to-day -day life, they gravitate either to something that they do or a subculture within a community or something of that nature. We have all done it to one degree or another. And then we look at your word and you remind us that we aren't who we once were, that we've been made a new creation in your son, Jesus Christ, that your spirit lives within us and is producing sanctification that leads to obedience. Father, we're grateful for these things. We, we know that this is a miraculous work that you're accomplishing in the life of believers throughout the course of this world. We know, Lord, the nature of the struggles that we have wrestled with before we came to know you. We also know the nature of the things that, if we're honest, we would have to say are things that we're still struggling with. But Father, we pray that you'd help us to see things with your eyes from a brand new perspective and that we wouldn't embrace the things that we're struggling with, that we wouldn't wrap our sense of identity around our struggles but that we would understand who we are forever in your family and in your kingdom. So thank you, Lord, for the various things that you mentioned to us in your word. Thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to look at these things and really wrestle with them. And thank you, Lord, for the guidance and grace that you show us in every season of our lives. Some of us are brand new to walking with you. Some of us, Lord, haven't even started our walk with you yet, but yet we're hearing your word proclaimed today. Some of us have been doing this for a little while now, and we can see the growth that you're producing. 
Some of us have, some de- have a few decades under our belt at this point, and we feel so distant and so removed from the people we were when we first came to meet you. Again, Lord, thank you for the miracle that you're doing in and among us. Continue to help us grow. Progressively sanctify us. Draw us close to yourself. And help us to be men and women who reflect the heart of your Son, Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the privilege that it is to know you through your Son and to be indwelled by your Holy Spirit. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.